Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the GigaCity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. The Radio and TV News Endowment, a fund established by listeners and viewers to sustain reporting of Indiana news. More information at indianapublicmedia.org slash support and by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Steel and aluminum tariffs that take effect today will have a far-reaching impact on the Hoosier State. Everyone's kind of crossing their fingers and hoping that it's not uh, not backbreaking, but uh, all of our suppliers are uh, telling us there will be price increases. Hoosier breweries worry it could stunt growth while other industries stand to benefit. President Trump's plan to combat the opioid epidemic reminds some people of the failed war on drugs. But Indiana's Attorney General is praising the initiative. Ahead, an expert joins us to unpack the legislation. The DNR says bobcats are thriving in the state and it's time to consider a trapping season. I think there needs to be more studies of the bobcat population before they uh, put this uh, proposal forward. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. President Trump's tariffs on imported steel and aluminum go into effect today, and they could negatively impact a growing industry in Indiana. Craft brewers are worried the tariffs will increase their costs. Reporter Barbara Brozier joins us now. Barbara, how big of an increase are we talking? Well, brewers I talked to, Joe, say it's too early to tell, but they say there will be a noticeable change in price. Now, the Brewers Association says canning is the most popular packaging method for new breweries. It has some of them worried the tariffs could stunt growth and increase prices for consumers. When you walk into the tap room at Sun King Brewing in Indianapolis, one of the first things you notice is the noise. There's the constant hum of brewing equipment in the background, and some of it comes from here. Last year we produced the equivalent of 30,000 barrels worth of beer, which is 60,000 kegs of beer, and a little over 50% of it went into aluminum cans. Sun King is one of the largest brewers in Indiana, and the owners decided to can their beer long before it became popular across the industry. We were actually the 53rd canning craft brewery in America. Um, and since that time, uh, it's grown to upwards of six or 700 canning breweries. Canning beer is more economical for most breweries. The cans protect the beer from sunlight and oxygen and are lighter to transport. But costs for breweries who package their beer in cans will likely go up with the introduction of a 10% tariff on most imported aluminum. The Brewers Association says 98% of can aluminum is produced in the U.S., but they worry the tariffs could incentivize an overall rise in aluminum prices. We have a contract on our aluminum for the entire year of 2018, so we won't see any major impact on it until the beginning of next year, but that'll be something that once it goes into place and we find out what it's really gonna do to the cost of aluminum, that we'll have to figure out what that does to the overall cost of beer. Smaller Indiana breweries like Taxman Brewing and Bargersville are more likely to feel the immediate impact of the tariffs. About half of the beer Taxman produces every year is canned. The brewery suppliers encourage them to stockpile as many as possible at the current price to temporarily avoid increased costs. But the brewery doesn't have the storage space to do that. Cans are always funny because you have to when getting printed cans, order a truckload, which is 25 pallets of 8,169 cans each. 
a lot of cans at once. McCloy says it's too early to tell just how much more they'll have to pay for cans. But he says it's an increased cost. They'll have to figure out how to make up. There is a possibility that our prices would have to reflect it. Uh, that's going to be a last resort. Obviously, we want to make it as accessible as possible. Experts say it's likely a lot of industries, not just breweries, will have to pass on the increased costs to customers. And it could happen soon. I would say that you will see price increases um, from producers to their customers starting pretty immediately after March 23rd, if not already in anticipation of March 23rd. But here's the silver lining. The price increase could be so minimal on something like a can of beer that you might not even notice. The price of a car, for example, because it has steel and aluminum in it, uh, could be expected to rise by as much as 1% as a result of these tariffs. And the price of, say, a can of soup could be expected to rise less than a penny. With even some of Indiana's smaller breweries on track to can more than a million beers this year, even a slight increase will add up to a significant cost. And brewers say it's more than just cans they're worried about. Aluminum cans are in people's hands every day, so it's a really easy thing to talk about, but the back end of our industry is run by stainless steel, so uh, any increase in the price of materials definitely affects people's ability to grow their businesses. Now, while some industries like breweries will see increased prices as a result of the tariffs, steel and aluminum producers in Indiana could actually stand to benefit. Those steel mills will have more certainty now. They will either be able to increase their market share and or raise prices, and they'll be able to plan for the future to a greater degree than they had did before these tariffs were imposed. And so, Joe, that's good mm -hmm. news for the 25,000 steel workers in Indiana. All right, thank you very much, Barbara. President Trump unveiled a plan to fight the opioid crisis earlier this week. He laid out a three-pronged strategy, but what he said regarding criminal justice may have received more attention. With us to talk about it is Dennis Watson, a professor of sociology at the Richard M. Fairbanks School of Public Health at IUPUI. Dennis, thank you so much for thank coming you. on. Thank you. Um, so before we get into that controversy, let's talk about the president's overall strategy to fight the crisis. His plan three-pronged. What does that mean? So from what I've been able to gather um, from reading the news, because it's not very well defined, there's three big targets that they have. And one is uh, education for individuals. So that's going to be aimed at reducing demand uh, for opioids. And then the second one is uh, the criminal justice component that you mentioned, which right now seems to be focused more on reducing uh, the flow of drugs into the country on the border, and then the expansion of access to treatment. Um, it's not really clear where the criminal justice component regarding the, the potential uh, change in um, the death penalty sentencing might come in, but I feel like it fits better with the, uh, the focus on the, the control of drugs into the country, the criminal justice response. Mm. So yeah, that's, the president, he caused a lot of uproar by saying the death penalty um, is an option when it comes to dealing with those who uh, deal drugs. So, you know, it's sort of a radical sta stance. What, what more did he say about that? And um, do you think that that's kind of the right plan of attack? Well, one of the things that struck me that was said in one of the clips that I saw was uh, responding to the fact that um, people might be sitting in prison for a significant amount of time and wasting taxpayers' dollars. But from my point of view um, and what I've seen with a lot of stuff is when we put people on death row, they tend to spend more time in prison. So that doesn't make logical sense to me. Um, in regards to uh, the death penalty more specifically being sought out, I think it's a politically popular option with some individuals because it's seen as a hardline stance that doesn't really have an impact. And we're seeing this uh, legislation, sort of similar types of legislation um, here in Indiana. We just had a bill passed recently that is seeking not death penalty, but a, a rise to a level one felony for certain types of uh, drug drug uh, sharing uh, dealing activities. So, so if, if the death penalty option is not the, the, some may say that's not the way to go, what is a better plan of attack for that? Expanding treatment is, is really the best way to go for making sure that people have access to something because when we're focusing on criminal justice responses, we are actually criminalizing a disease um, and punishing people for the symptoms of their disease. A lot of the individuals who are going to be caught up in legislation like this are people who are not dealing to make a profit. They're not necessarily criminals in that way. They're individuals who are dealing because they're addicted and they're supporting. It's a symptom to support mm -hmm. their addiction so they don't withdraw from the drugs. All right. Thank you very much.
I uh, appreciate you being here. Yeah, thank you. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Governor Eric Holcomb is calling for a special session so lawmakers can finish work on key bills that died last week when lawmakers ran out of time at session's end. Holcomb says he's worked with legislative leaders to lay out a specific agenda for the special meeting. Uh, we should not bring new items um, um, to the table in a special session. Again, a few items to deal with in a few days, and then let's take care of the people's business and then give back to the people. The Speaker of the House, Brian Bosma, says he hopes to limit the session to one day. The General Assembly last met in special session in 2009 to write a state budget. A top education official in Indiana is opposing President Donald Trump's suggestion that arming teachers would be an effective way to prevent mass sh shootings in schools. State Superintendent of Public Instruction Jennifer McCormick says Indiana is one of a few states that allows school districts to arm their own teachers. No one to date is taking advantage of that and there's a reason for that. Um, I too think that's a really bad idea. I think there are more risk than reward when you're talking about arming teachers. McCormick says she was disappointed that lawmakers failed last week to approve a school funding safety measure. That bill would have added $5 million to the millions Indiana already spends annually on safety grants to schools. The State Board of Education decided earlier this year to change the state's school accountability system, aiming for new rules to start this fall. But at a meeting Wednesday, many members agreed to press pause on the issue. Board members will meet and likely vote on a decision to delay the new rulemaking process until the first week of April. Well, it will be months before a study of Vigo County's jail is complete, but residents got an update on the project this week. Commissioners proposed building a new jail last year, but faced significant community pushback. They called for an independent assessment before moving forward. A private firm is conducting the study, which examines whether the current facility needs to be expanded or if the county needs to build a new jail altogether. Vigo County has faced several lawsuits because of overcrowding at its jail, and RJS Justice Services says the facility doesn't meet constitutional jail regulations. The designs and the way it's had to been, it's, 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 it's been used to try to meet all these different population changes with the inmates has made, has given it an environmental conditions problem. Data from the study will be used to predict future needs at the jail and whether its current procedures are sustainable. Residents had no shortage of questions. If the jail is where we are going to put people who have done wrong, then I want to know what would happen to someone much as myself if I were to do something wrong. RJS will provide one more update on the study before presenting a final report this summer. A garden honoring Hoosier women who took up manufacturing and labor jobs during World War II is being constructed in Bedford. Bedford. It's called the Rosie the Riveter Memorial Garden. It includes several rose bushes dedicated to local women who worked in manufacturing. The goal of the garden is to remind younger generations of the part women played during the war. But trying to get them to know that all these women did three or four jobs to help support the men, uh, their husbands, their, their sons, their ne nephews. They all did these jobs to make sure they came home safe. Now, she says the Bedford Garden is the first Rosie the Riveter garden in the Midwest and one of 24 across the country. How cool, Joe, to see something that, you know, women did honored um, right here in Indiana. I think how great that'll look all lush to you in the summer. Thanks, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. The DNR is proposing a bobcat trapping season to control the population's growing numbers. But some worry about the impact on the once endangered species. Plus, rubber band powered airplanes take flight under the historic dome of the West Baden Hotel. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week. 
and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! I knew it. It's just a blanket. Laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. The Department of Natural Resources is proposing several changes to fish and wildlife policies, including one that would allow hunting and trapping bobcats. Officials removed bobcats from the state's endangered species list in 2005, and the DNR says the population is thriving. Lindsay Wright joins me now. Lindsay, this isn't the only proposal people are concerned about, is it? It's not, Joe, but it's definitely the most controversial. Another proposal would require licensed animal control workers to euthanize raccoons, coyotes, and opossums that are causing problems on people's properties. Those who are against these two proposals say they want to see more data before the DNR moves ahead with what they consider a big policy switch. James Mahoney loves to watch wild animals walk around his property. That's why he put up trail cameras. Anything that walks in front of this camera out to so many feet, 50 feet or so, uh, it'll take its picture and you'll see it walk by. Mahoney has a special compassion for animals. He owns several horses and even rehabilitates animals, including this fox named Baby. He says that's why it's kind of surprising for people to learn he's been hunting and trapping animals his whole life. We could love these animals to death, but if there's not a harvest, then you got an overabundance. Mahoney says that's why he thinks it could be time for the state to start allowing bobcat harvesting. He's taught hunter education for more than 40 years and says it's just part of conservation. We, we, got, we've, we got pictures of them on our trail cameras here where they come right around here and, and come close by. Right now they're beautiful to see. I don't know if I could kill one, but if we have to, we have to. The DNR points to evidence they say shows the bobcat population is robust enough to start a hunting season. Numbers started going up in the early 2000s, and now bobcats seem to be thriving, especially in the southern part of the state. The DNR says workers don't do population counts because it's costly and the numbers are always changing. But still, the species has been spotted in more than half of the state's counties since 1970. What we do instead is we look at trends. So the surveys we have, and for bobcats, we have two main ones and then a third one we use to supplement it. We look at how the population is changing and at what rate it's changing. At a public meeting in Mitchell, several farmers spoke in favor of the proposal. The reason why we have so many bobcats in southern Indiana is because they're coming from Kentucky. They claim bobcats are wreaking havoc on their properties and depleting the turkey and rabbit populations. Trapper Charles Davis says the DNR should also listen to hunters and trappers because they're the boots on the ground. This year I quit trapping coyotes because I couldn't run the traps for the bobcats. I caught two bobcats and I only had 10 traps out. But that's not good enough for Sierra Club Director Bowden Quinn. He worries allowing hunting could wipe out the population. I mean, it, it doesn't make for fun reading if you care about animals in general. As he reads um, through the DNR's proposal, he gets hung up on what he says is missing, specific data. Aside from that, he says there could be an economic incentive to leave bobcats be for now. I've seen bobcats twice, not here in Indiana, but in California. And it's a big thrill. And of course, you only say it for a second because it's taken off. Um, but uh, how cool would it be if, if in Indiana, people had a chance to see bobcats when they went for a walk in the woods? But bobcat hunting isn't the only proposal causing outrage. Mike Maservi has owned advanced pest control for the last 14 years. Uh, originally, I was into lake management. But everyone kept on asking me what to do about the raccoons under their porches on the lakes. Maservi says his catch and release policy for nuisance animals is why a lot of customers use his service. 
but a DNR proposal would require him to euthanize raccoons, opossums, and coyotes. He only puts down animals that have disease, and he sees no reason for the DNR to take such a hard line. It's just heartbreaking. If you've ever had to put down a baby mama or a mama with babies clinging to her fur, and we're going to have to put them in a box and gas them with, usually it's carbon monoxide, but there's other ways, uh, and some of them are quite gruesome. Maservi says he should be able to choose whether to euthanize an animal. But the DNR says the policy wouldn't have a significant impact and would only be used in rare situations when removal is necessary. Mahoney also owns an animal control business, and he says releasing the animals only moves the problem around. Although opponents say the DNR isn't providing enough information, Mahoney says conservation experts exist for a reason, and the state should consider their expertise. Because they're knowledgeable, because they're, that's their profession. They're, they're, they have a, not because they have a degree, but because they've, they've been, they're in the field. Lindsay Wright joins us for a little bit more. You know, we've done some reporting on the changes for otter trapping. Would this be kind of the same? Yeah, it would be highly regulated, even more so than otters. The hunting season would be shorter, the quota would be even more strict, and hunters would have to report their bobcats within 24 hours to make sure the numbers are really up to date. Folks with the DNR say, you know, they're really proud of how successful the population growth has been. These tight regulations would be to ensure that the population isn't at risk. So the Natural Resources Commission will most likely take up this proposal public input on its at its meeting on May 10th and if it's approved the DNR will have the ability to put it into place. Lindsay thank you very much. You're welcome. Hoosiers who serve prison time face challenges even after their release. According to the Indiana Department of Correction nearly 37 percent of offenders who were released in 2013 returned to prison within three years. As Taylor Haggerty reports, Indiana State University students got a first-hand look at those challenges during a simulation this week. The re-entry correctional simulation included four 15-minute segments, each representing a week of the first month out of incarceration. Students started out with a packet of information about the character they would play, including a name, the crime they were charged with, and their financial resources. The students then had to complete tasks like paying rent, buying groceries, or finding a job. Some had to visit parole officers or even begin work on their GEDs before time was up. Kaviana Brown-Williams is a senior studying criminal justice at ISU. This is her second time participating in the seminar. And I thought it would be a lot easier, but then you had to um, add in stuff like travel. Um, we had to have bus tickets and our um, probation officer had to make sure everything was okay. And if we missed like certain steps, like they would send us all the way back to the beginning. At the end of each week, program organizers would gather the students and check on their progress and remaining resources. Those of you with your hands up, if you don't come to work next week, you are fired. Anissa Williams is re-entry affairs coordinator for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. She says not every student got the same information. If they have their social security card and birth certificate, means of identification, they'll re-enter back into a lot quicker possibly. However, if they don't have those pieces of identification, it's going to be very difficult for them to get services, a place to live, or even a job. All of the participants were students studying criminal justice. Williams says once they graduate, they'll be the ones working with people trying to re-enter the community. So our hope is for them to have a better understanding of what people who are already pay their debts to society is going to experience once they come home. The simulation is part of a larger seminar program. Williams says they also visit inmates to show them exactly what they need to accomplish once they start the process of re-entry. But Brown Williams says the program could be a valuable resource for everyone. I'm in criminal justice, so I know what it takes and uh, what happens before and after. But there's a lot of people who um, that grow up and don't have to realize they don't really know consequences. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Taylor Haggerty. People from all over the globe came to West Baden this week to compete in the Academy of Model Aeronautics World Championship. The lightweight models are powered by a tightly wound rubber band. 
Teams are ranked by how long their aircraft remain in flight, and the atrium at the West Baden Hotel makes for perfect flying conditions. It's kind of a blend of technology and uh, it borders on being a sport. I wouldn't really call it that, but it's, it's similar to things like, uh, you can think of it in terms of the Olympics or bicycle racing. About 60 competitors from 13 countries participated. An American took home first place. And good luck to the IU women this weekend. They advanced to the WNIT Elite Eight after beating Purdue for a third time this season. They play Sunday at home, tip off at 2 p.m. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the GigaCity company. Fiber Internet, HD, and digital IPTV in southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. The Radio and TV News Endowment, a fund established by listeners and viewers to sustain reporting of Indiana news. More information at indianapublicmedia.org slash support. And by WTIU members. Thank you.